donc Philippe va vous présenter en fait un, un résumé hein, d'un gros projet qui a duré euh, 4, 4, 5 ans. Voilà, euh, sur, euh, donc autour du Limes avec une approche interdisciplinaire à la fois euh, euh, archéologique, euh, paléo-environnementale, euh, économique et puis euh, euh, comment euh, euh, je dirais spatial, quoi, pour dire ça au, au, sens, au sens large, avec de, de la modélisation et de l'analyse spatiale à l'aide de, de systèmes d'information géographique et puis de modélisation multi-agents. Euh, donc un autre collègue en fait, a travaillé aussi sur, sur, ce, sur ce projet qui s'appelle Marc, je ne sais jamais prononcer son nom, donc je te laisse, Marc Grunhausen, merci qui, qui va soutenir bientôt euh, une, une thèse en fait, sur ce projet. Et qui est, enfin, je, je le cite parce qu'il il est venu plusieurs fois à Besançon et euh, donc euh, il travaille euh, assez étroitement euh, avec nous sur les questions de, de réseau. Euh, voilà, donc euh, Philippe Ferhagen donc, vient de l'université euh, d'Amsterdam. Euh, C'est quelqu'un qu'on connaît depuis très longtemps parce que donc, François Pierre Tournu, qui est dans la salle. <rire> a commencé à travailler avec lui et moi, et donc il n'y a pas loin de 30 ans maintenant, enfin, vous deux, et moi un peu moins, 25 ans. Voilà. Et on a travaillé en fait sur le projet qui s'appelait Archéomédès, donc avec François Favori, vous connaissez sans doute. Et donc la personne qui encadrait ce gros projet était Sander van der Leu, en fait, qui du coup avait rassemblé un petit peu tout ce monde-là. Euh, par la suite, ben, on s'est un peu perdu de vue et on a retravaillé ensemble en 2000, à partir de 2011 sur un projet qui s'appelait IAPMA où on travaillait sur de la modélisation spatiale. Et donc depuis, on travaille régulièrement sur un certain nombre de projets. Et euh, là, le, le, le dernier, c'est plutôt sur des questions de, de modélisation en fait, du, de, de la mobilité en fait, dans le passé, mais qui est toujours euh, une réflexion menée... Euh, euh, par rapport à l'étude du peuplement, en fait, dans la très, très longue durée. Hein, voilà. Donc, on étudie, en fait, les chemins, euh, la modélisation des, des chemins, des itinéraires, etc. Euh, mais dans cette perspective, en fait, de construction des espaces territoriaux et de, et de peuplement, et de systèmes de peuplement. Voilà. Et donc, euh, le projet que va vous présenter euh, euh, Philippe euh, reste quand même en partie dans cette philosophie-là euh, aussi. Voilà. Je te laisse la parole. Voilà. Juste pour dire quand même, parce que évidemment, Philippe est ici en fait dans le cadre d'un mois de professeur euh, invité, euh, financé par l'Université de Franche-Comté, et donc il est pendant un mois ici à la, à la Maison des sciences de l'homme et de l'environnement. Donc normalement, son séjour se termine à la fin de cette semaine. Et ben, on, il reviendra sans doute <rire> plus tard. Voilà, merci Philippe. Ok, merci. Bon, euh, je vais le faire en anglais. Euh... For the benefit of Simon, I will do this in English, <laughs> and also because it will uh, be quicker, I think, when I do it in English. So I hope that is okay for everyone. Try to slow down a little bit. Uh, can you all hear me good? well? In the, yeah? Okay, no problem. Good. Okay, so as Laura already explained, uh, this is basically the final report of a big project, five-year project, uh, that I've done together with my two PhD students. Mark was already mentioned as uh, one of the people involved, but also Jamie Joyce, uh, who did a lot of the agent-based modeling, uh, was the other PhD student, and both will hopefully be pre defending their PhD in, well, maybe four or five months. So it's, uh, it's almost finished, everything. So what I will do now is to present uh, in about one hour uh, the project background. I will talk a little bit about the archaeological data set that is underlying the project. And then I will give three examples of what we try to do. First one has to do with uh, demography, and, but I'm not sure if that is still... I think I, I cut that for today. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I will t tell you something about the agricultural modeling uh, that we did, so trying to actually simulate uh, agricultural production in a computer model. And I will be talking about uh, our attempts to reconstruct uh, the mm. transport network in the area uh, in the Roman period. So the demography is uh, skipped for today. Mm -hmm. Where did this 
where did I come from? A uh, long time ago, in 2011, uh, I attended a workshop in uh, Basel, very close to here, <coughs> which uh, was titled Calculations in Archaeobiology. And uh, to my surprise, uh, at that time, uh, people were almost unaware of the existence of GIS. Uh, there were no uh, studies that presented anything that had to do with, uh, with, <coughs> with computational modeling. So, yeah, I thought, well, how can this be? Because I had worked in other areas, other time periods, and this was specifically focused on Roman archaeology, and people seemed to be not doing this kind of stuff. At the time, uh, the approaches that were available in uh, paleoeconomic analysis, mainly in GIS, uh, were things like uh, site catchment analysis, I had been working myself also on things like agricultural potential modeling, and we have been working a lot on predictive modeling uh, at the time, all very much GIS-based, and for that reason also fairly uh, static, because it's all based on yeah, uh, snapshots of, uh, of times. And I had been trying to work out a little bit how to do more dynamical modeling, so following uh, things through time, but within GIS that proved to be extremely challenging. So, at the same time, we saw a development of agent-based modeling coming up as, an, uh, as a new development in computational modeling, especially the big Mesa Verde project in the United States, which was run by uh, Timothy Kohler uh, and colleagues, uh, has been an important step in that regard because they tried to understand the development of settlements and, uh, and land use through time by applying a different type of technique uh, than GIS by applying something called agent-based modeling, and I will come to that later. So, I thought, well, maybe there's a project there, uh, which I submitted with uh, the National Science Foundation in the Netherlands within what is called the VIDI Innovative Incentive Scheme. Um, basically, this is the largest post postdoc project that allows you to employ yourself as a principal investigator plus to PhD students. This was submitted the end of October 2011 to, uh, yeah, to my great delight and somewhat to my surprise. It was granted as well uh, in 2012. So we could start uh, in September 2012 and formally the project is now finished. I mean, the financing has run out, but we are still working on the finishing of the PhD projects and the final publication. I think what I mainly wanted to, uh, yeah, to do there uh, was to see if we could actually use uh, spatiotemporal modeling to better understand the economy in the past. And uh, this ambition had, of course, to be tried out in a specific context. And this is where the actual uh, study area comes in, uh, the Dutch area of uh, the Roman frontier, the Limes. So we're talking about a time period that runs from roughly uh, 15 before Christ until the end of what we call the Middle Roman period, which is uh, basically the end of the Roman frontier in the area. I mean, the Romans did not completely leave after that, but changes at that point in time are so so big that it would be very, uh, uh, very stupid to try to approach this in, the, in a similar way. So the idea was basically to look at the development of the Roman periods in that area, starting from when the Romans came in until the point that they were forced to leave. The area itself is uh, yeah, relatively big. Uh, it runs from uh, the coast. Um, and now I might, might need some. Yeah, I can use a little bit of pointing. From the coast over here, where there was a fort actually protecting the coastline uh, all the way down the River Rhine up to the German border over here. Uh, well, the area north of that was, of course, not formal part of the Roman Empire, even when the Romans did, uh, did do things there. And the part south was obviously part of the Roman Empire, and there were two tribes living there. One was called the Batavians, the biggest one here on the east, and a smaller one in the west called the Cananifates. <coughs> As you may have noticed, the geography of the area has changed a lot. I mean, the actual course of the Rhine these days uh, goes this way, all the way to Rotterdam. So part of the challenge here is really that we are dealing with a landscape that has changed quite a bit 
over the last 2,000 years. So why would this area be sort of interesting, interesting test bed to uh, start playing around with new modeling approaches? Well, first of these is the availability of quite a bit of archaeological data. Um, so people had been working a lot in that area, also because in the Netherlands since the late 1990s, most of the work is done by commercial companies and there's a lot of development going on. So you get lots of data in. but. At the time, there were few synthetic studies. I mean, it starts to change now, but at the time it was really uh, quite hard. Um, interesting aspect of the region is that uh, because it is a lowland area with a lot of uh, rivers and peat, it means that organic remains are usually well preserved. So we know a little bit more, I guess, about how people lived in the time than in a lot of area, other areas. And it's also a bit of a special case within the Roman Empire, and this is partly because of the landscape setting that I just uh, told you about, but also because the Batavian tribe, the big tribe, uh, had a special position in the empire. They were the, the mercenary troops of the Roman army, and they were sent all over the empire to fight uh, the barbarians. And they also were the imperial guard of the Roman emperor, so they were really important. <coughs> um, so, in a sense, I thought it would be a good test bed for new approaches, but yeah, also because it is quite a bit of a special area, it was also, yeah, I think nice for the funders to actually uh, to look at this area and not at, uh, yeah, at an area that would be less, uh, uh, less attractive in that sense. So, when you talk about uh, setting up such a project, there are certain building blocks involved. Um, we have, of course, the archaeological data. We have coupled to that uh, paleogeographical, paleoenvironmental data. And uh, yeah, this is actually what you start to work with in archaeology every time. Then the idea is really to uh, link this to the modeling through the conceptual models that uh, people have developed. So on the one hand, there were ideas about how people lived, their subsistence mode. There were ideas about how the population developed. Uh, how many people were there, what was the settlement density in the area, and there are ideas about the macroeconomical development. Uh, for example, the uh, coming of the Romans implied that yeah, they needed lots of stuff that people were not uh, necessarily producing uh, in the area. Um, so the models uh, that I'm talking about mainly have to do with this economic aspect, the subsistence and surplus production, to some extent with the population development and also to some extent with the interaction between the Romans and the locals. And yeah, then obviously uh, the big challenge is also to see if you can connect this from the very individual level of the individual settlement to the higher level of what happens over the region. So pretty ambitious. Um, I'm not saying we solved everything, far from it, uh, but at least it is a good framework to, uh, to think about it. <coughs> The other thing uh, about the uh, dynamical modeling, uh, I said agent-based modeling, but it's no, not all agent-based. Agent-based is a specific type of modeling that uh, works uh, with uh, individual agents that are given uh, the option to do certain things. So in the scheme over there, you would see, for example, that an agent who might be a farmer in the region uh, is uh, considering of doing certain things, like, for example, growing a crop. Um, the agent will be uh, uh, given uh, certain conditions, saying, okay, well, it may be profitable to do this here, or it may not be profit profitable to do it here. The agent will make then a decision based on the assumed costs and benefits, and then, of course, this will have consequences for what happens next. Uh, so this idea of a circular modeling is basically what, uh, what makes it dynamical, so at every step, things can change. And some of the changes are internal in the system because it is what happens because of the choices that the agents make and other things can be external because suddenly a whole army comes into the area and starts changing the conditions. Uh, obviously, uh, yeah, they are called simulations which does not mean that they are completely realistic. They can't be because that would be too, uh, <coughs> too difficult. But yeah, I, I didn't think it would be good to keep it completely abstract, so yeah, we try to play a lot with what can the data tell us, what can the hypothesis tell us, and what are the results of the modeling. 
important aspects of this kind of modeling is that we are doing it not just in a temporal dimension, but also in a spatial dimension, which actually was a very challenging part, and we haven't really solved everything there. <coughs> And the nice thing about doing it this way is also that you start from the micro scale, so from the individual agent, and then you actually see patterns that are going on at the larger scale, at the, at the macro scale. Uh, proponents of agent-based modeling always say it is a good way to explore cause and effect. Uh, I still believe that is true, but I also have noticed that actually understanding the causes and effects on the basis of this kind of modeling is not the easiest. But since you can build different scenarios and say, okay, what happens if the agent, for example, wants to grow this particular crop or another particular crop, what happens if the agent is working in this area and not in that area, you can try to figure out what the different outcomes are and then try to compare these to the known data. So that's, in a nutshell, what you try to do with this kind of modeling. Now, as this cartoon shows you, it should be easy. Well, it isn't. <coughs> um, Part of the problem here is, I think, that uh, many of the theories uh, that are around in archaeology are not very clearly specified. Uh, I have, uh, yeah, I've always assumed that it would be best to approach this from via the route of what is called middle-range theory in archaeology. So, yeah, basically talking about theories that only can be specified in one way, that also specify cause and effect. So, what would happen if you do this or that? and that they would also be yeah, more general theories that could be applied in other regions. So if I'm talking about a model of agricultural production, whether I'm doing this in the Netherlands or in France, should it make a big difference? Because the model works the same, but only the parameters will have to, have to change because I'm working in a, with a different soil type or with a different kind of uh, settlement structure. And in that way, hopefully, these models can be kept independent of what yeah, uh, people think in very broad terms about uh, cultural developments. The other thing is obviously that you can't model everything. So yeah, the idea of keeping it, uh, keeping it small and realistic is really one of the, the, the biggest challenges, I would say. And also, these kind of models can be very sensitive to uncertainty and error. And, and that's something that you have to figure out on the go because yeah, it's sometimes very hard to understand this before you actually start it. Which means that it is really important when you do this kind of modeling to also uh, find ways to assess the model errors and to figure out what the effects of the errors can be on the modeling results. Now, so far the theory. <coughs> Let's see what we have in terms of data. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the archaeological data set. Um, we also have a paleo-environmental data set, a paleo-environmental reconstruction of the area, which is much more detailed than the one I just showed in the first slide, but I won't go into detail there. Uh, but the archaeological data set is interesting because it is something that almost every archaeological bigger project runs into. So we had a lot of inventories, local inventories. Um, local records from different uh, places. We have a national database. We have a database of uh, published reports. And this altogether is already a substantial amount of data to deal with. And then I, from the start, I said, I'm go only going to look at data that is publicly accessible. And in the Netherlands, fortunately, about 80% of it is publicly accessible, but I'm perfectly aware that yeah, you can't get everything. You can't talk to everyone. You can't look at each single report to figure out if there is something extra. The idea was really yeah, to find as much as possible and yeah, to make sure that this is as representative as possible. Now. Then the basic thing is, of course, that we wanted to know where people might have lived during the Roman period and where uh, and, and when this was. <coughs> uh, well, this is a problem that had been discussed uh, by uh, archaeologists in the area for quite some time. And, yeah, my colleague Wouter Voss at some point uh, wrote, well, pff, you know, whatever kind of inventory you take, they always come up with something different, which is obviously also what we did. <coughs> um, 
we applied a few criteria that hopefully are uh, clear enough and basic enough uh, for uh, for other people to to use. So we say, okay, we need a certain number of shirts because much of it is field survey that has to be dated to the Roman period. They need to be found in proximity to each other. The 250 ma meter radius is of course a bit arbitrary, but yeah, it would sort of fit the general idea of uh, how big a site uh, can be in the area. And sometimes you also find more diagnostic materials. So if then the 10 shirt uh, criterion is not meant, then you can say, okay, well in this case, we actually know there is something there because we found a huge milestone or something like that. <coughs> Uncertainties, uh, well, they won't be surprising uh, to you, of course. They have to deal with uh, how certain are we that things are found at the place uh, where they are uh, registered. More importantly, uh, how certain are we that things are from the period that they are supposed to be. And also, if uh, shirts are found, how easy is it to say something about the function of the actual uh, site that you're looking at? The fourth one uh, is probably the most crucial, is where to find the documentation. And I was really surprised uh, that it is very difficult to figure this out on the basis of both digital and non-digital uh, uh, sources. So yeah, we spent quite a bit of effort actually on trying to put all the documentation in one system. In the end, this resulted in a database of approximately 1,100 settlements, uh, chronology initially based on what the archaeologists said about it, <coughs> interpretation also based on their expert judgment, um, and providing links to the available doc documentation. So if this database is going to be reused, then you will actually be able to figure out how it was constructed, which is already uh, quite useful, I think. Now, the chronology was actually the most uh, interesting bit to, uh, to think about. <coughs> because if you look in how these things are dated in the Netherlands, uh, yeah, each object that is found is given a dating. And the dating is given at three levels of specificity. So on the one hand, you could say it's, it's either Iron Age or Roman period. You could say, okay, well, within these periods, we have different uh, sub-periods. And within the Roman period, there are even two more subdivisions. Clearly these periods don't have the same length. Uh, so if you look at the time span, then you see that some of these are fairly short, like the early Roman uh, A period, and uh, yeah, other ones are, are, are a bit larger, which also means that if you are talking about a time-based modeling, yeah, that you will have to understand that these periods are, uh, are not the same. So if you then try to figure out, okay, how probable is it that people actually did something on that spot at this particular point in time, uh, we looked at uh, work that was done by uh, Andrew Bevan and Enrico Crema in 2010 on yeah, trying to uh, come up with a more fuzzy dating of sites and objects. I think they worked initially on pottery, uh, but it can easily be done on uh, all kinds of badly dated uh, materials. And very simply what you do is you just uh, subdivide a badly dated object per sub-period to come up with a probability that this object is actually present in the particular sub-period. So if I am looking at this one that is dated uh, on a 700 year time span, well then the probability that this thing is actually dating from the early Roman A period is fairly small, it's like 5%. So, and if you have one that has a time span of 162 years, then obviously the probabilities that it is part of one of these uh, periods uh, increase. So this is how we uh, try to approach this. What you then end up with, for example, if you have three of these objects in one, uh, one observation, then you can just add them and say, okay, well, this is the aoristic sum. So it gives you a kind of a frequency distribution of the, of the, temporal, uh, uh, the temporal spans. Mm. It is, as mm. far as I can see, a fairly straightforward method to do this. Uh, but yeah, how good it is, we don't really know. Because I think if you talk to uh, experts on pottery, they might probably tell you that certain things are dated very widely because 
yeah, there is a certain subtype that dates very early, but the majority dates from another period. So there, there could be a lot more behind it, but for the moment this is uh, on the basis of a very big database. Uh, this is the first entry. Now, what you get then is that you get a dating probability per observation. Uh, so we have lots of observation. These are uh, in principle sites, or they could be combined into sites. Um, we have a number of finds per observation, and uh, we have, of course, the time span uh, there. So you get this little list of probabilities per observation uh, per time period. So some, sometimes they're unknown. Well, not much that we can do about that. And here's the time span. And then the next step was to really uh, try to figure out, okay, so when would such uh, material actually allow me to say with a certain uh, confidence that this actually was a site? So does it match this criterion of more than 10 shirts at this particular spot at a particular point in time? And for this we used uh, Monte Carlo simulation, so on the basis of these probabilities in the, in the earlier table, uh, we assigned, si uh, we assigned the, the sites to a particular period in a simulation procedure. So every time we said, okay, well, a uh, random number is such and such. If the random number is uh, smaller than the actual probability, then the, side, the, then the observation is placed in this period. You do this again and again and again, and you get uh, a, whole, uh, a whole distribution of possible uh, finds. So, for example, if you look here at the first uh, row, the, the late Iron Age for this particular observation, the probability that uh, there are more than five uh, finds in from the uh, late Iron Age is really very low. <coughs> um, and so on. And the only one that actually uh, has the probability of ten or more finds is, in this case, the Middle Roman A period. Uh, so, in this way, we could end up with averages here, saying, okay, well, on average, we will find three shirts in this period, almost seven in this period, and this is actually completely comparable to the aoristic sum, uh, but the interesting thing is that we can actually make the cut here and say, okay, well, give me everything that gives me more than 10 shirts. So here you go. Now. We use this to try to figure out uh, the general trends in uh, settlement uh, density in the area. Uh, now, first, this is the number of uh, simulated finds. Well, you see that the actual uh, amount of, uh, of sites that has a more than 50% probability of 10 or more shirts is substantial, but about half of what we had. So. From the sites that we have available, about half of them we cannot date very precisely. Uh, the other thing that you see is obviously also a consequence of doing this is that only the ones that are relatively well dated also show a clear pattern in increase and decrease. You can also do something similar with the changes in uh, simulated find numbers. Uh, so you can see here, for example, that in the Roman Middle A period there is a very sharp increase in simulated number of finds and a very sharp decrease in the Roman late A period. And you can also look at uh, how the changes in these simulated uh, sites are, again showing a substantial increase in the Middle Roman A and a substantial decrease in the Late Roman A, which is completely in accordance with what we knew about it, but yeah. Uh, it is very interesting to see that this also works for this kind of uh, kind of analysis. There is, however, a little thing here that is uh, due to the fact that we're using poorly dated base evidence. Um, if you look at the actual excavation evidence, then you will see, for example, that we see here uh, from the Roman middle B to the Roman late A, there seems to be a lot of continuity. This is absolutely not visible in the excavated sites because the cut is over here at 275. So part of this may be just due to the fact that field survey data just has a lot of poorly dated, uh, poorly dated evidence and we're not going to solve this in this way. 
So in the end, I think it is a robust method mainly to analyze your dating quality. Maybe not the best method to actually analyze your site density developments, even when the general patterns were sort of confirmed. But for these, you really should be looking at the well-dated sites, and then we see this effect of the Middle Roman settlement explosion and the Late Roman decline very well reflected in our data. So I think there could be a lot of improvements there, which basically mean a lot of work at the base. Because, yeah, then you would really have to look back at all the objects and say, okay, so what are these actually worth? And do we need to think about other ways of actually describing these? That is a problem that we couldn't solve in our, uh, in our project. Now, moving from the archaeological data and its uh, chronology problems uh, to one of the fundamental questions that we tried to address, and that was uh, if there actually was a situation in which uh, the local population was capable of producing surplus agricultural uh, products for the Roman army. Um, as, I, as I just said, the Romans, they came into the area and there were a lot of them compared to the people who were staying there. And they needed lots of stuff. Um, and it was always sort of questioned if this was possible at all, given the low population density, uh, given the, uh, yeah, the general setting of the area with a lot of wet areas. And it's only fairly recently, over the last 10 years, that uh, we start to find evidence that actually the local population did produce for the army, be it at a possibly limited scale, but I mean, uh, there is absolutely no reason why there should not have been uh, production for the Roman army. <coughs> um, so we thought, okay, well, this can be explored in more detail. Um, so, like I just said, uh, what we wanted to do uh, with the agent-based modeling is to, yeah, to try, on the one hand, to incorporate the spatial and temporal depth, <coughs> and yeah, look also at the interactions between the various elements of the agricultural economy, because a lot of archaeological uh, research is either focusing on paleobotany, either focusing on archaeozoology, either focusing on, uh, on paleogeography, and it is very difficult to bring these, uh, these things together. And, well, this basically shows you why, because even if you have a very simple kind of model, it, uh, this model is uh, trying to understand how you do stock breeding, the number of elements that you have to include is quite substantial, and not all of them are the easiest. So, for example, we have to figure out what is the demand of supplies for the Roman army. Well, we can have some ideas, but nobody really knows. The Romans didn't keep records about that. Uh, we have to know how people actually produce their uh, uh, their cereals or their uh, or their animals, and we don't have very good information on that. So, even when the model itself is conceptually not very complex in terms of actually running it, it is quite a thing. Um, Jamie Joyce. Uh, did most did did most of this, and he uh, started out by trying to figure out at a very basic level, okay, how do, did people actually go about breeding sheep, as being a relatively simple kind of uh, kind of activity. Um, so this is an output from the programming environment net logo that we used. Uh, well, you see, there is lots of uh, sliders and uh, screens and stuff uh, that you can uh, that you can put into there to see, for example, what would be the average milk production coming out if the sheep herds actually uh, were viable or if they would die because uh, they didn't have enough to eat. Um, so there's lots of elements that he put into there and that he tried to run and see what happens if you change the parameters. So he did this also for, uh, for cattle and also for horses, but I'm not going to talk about the horses today. <coughs> um, but for the cattle and the sheep, uh, yeah, the most important scenarios that were suggested in the literature were that uh, people either use them for the production of meats uh, or for the production of wool in the case of sheep or in the case of cattle, that they would have herds that would provide them with animals for manure and traction in arable farming. And the third scenario was that, well, maybe you can also exploit these uh, animals to get as much milk as possible. 
Um, interestingly, uh, these models uh, show that uh, when you specialize in uh, milk and meat, you actually also produce more manure. Um, that was something that we did not really expect uh, in advance, but the reason is basically uh, that the herds will grow larger if people try to maximize the production. <coughs> so because you have larger herds, you will also have more manure. So there is a positive feedback there possible between actually producing more goods for the market and also getting more manure and thus also being able to increase your agricultural production. So there is a positive feedback there possible. The other thing that we didn't uh, really think about in advance was the role of the possible role of milk in this, uh, because all the archaeological evidence is about butchering. Uh, so, actually, the amount of calories that you can obtain from, uh, especially cattle, by making cheese is higher than what you can obtain from producing meat. Uh, we don't actually know if this was the case, but it was an interesting conclusion uh, from the model. For cereal production, um, we also tried uh, to work with three uh, different scenarios. The first one was a scenario of, say, no surplus, subsistence production. The other one was a scenario of extensification, defined as taking more land in production to increase your yields. And the other one was intensification, meaning that you don't take any more land in production, but just try to uh, get more yield out of your existing land, which would imply, in this case, applying more, uh, more manure. One of the main limitations here is the availability of workforce, uh, especially when you start to extensify, uh, you need a lot more people to, uh, to actually work the land. And there is also the issue that, of course, when you start to increase your area for production of agricultural uh, products, then it goes at the expense of other possible uses. So we were also interested if this would actually happen or not. Um, furthermore, when you talk about uh, increasing your yield, one of the important issues is really about the risk of crop failure and how you take care of that. So there were lots of debates about this surplus production, how much it could have been. And clearly, uh, yeah, the farmers would have been really stupid if they would have s supplied the Roman army with more than they could miss. So that was also something that we needed to, uh, to figure out. Um, main conclusions. Uh, the no surplus scenario, uh, even when it's called a no surplus scenario, uh, leads to surplus. It's small and it's unreliable because the yields are variable. But still, uh, in every almost every run that we did, there was surplus and it, yeah, so it could have been available. But it was very small and probably for the Roman army it would not have been very interesting because they couldn't rely from one year on the other how much they would get. If you then sort of push up the production and uh, go for a maximum surplus, uh, depending on the workforce and the availability of land, uh, you still have to take into account that only about 70% of the surplus is actually available for sale, for selling or for, uh, or for taking away. Because otherwise, again, the farmers will not be able to, uh, to produce in the longer run. Uh, what we didn't expect, actually, at the beginning was that uh, uh, extensification, so taking more land, this production is much more effective in uh, pushing, up, uh, pushing up production. Because, uh, yeah, you don't need to do anything extra, just all the seeds that you have left from last year, you throw it in a new, uh, new area and it will produce. And it's a sort of self-enforcing self effect that is only limited by the availability of the workforce that can grow, uh, that can grow there. Uh, but on the other side, if you talk about intensification, this is really a strategy, as was also clear from the, uh, from the cattle modeling, that is really easy to combine with an actual animal husbandry uh, mm. production uh, strategy as well. So in this case, the limitation of the workforce, but the amount of animals that you, can, uh, that you can manage. And it seems also that this is better suited when you have a larger settlement. If you have a very small settlement with just one family, it's very difficult to manage uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of animals. Mm. So some interesting 
ideas here about what could have happened. Uh, we don't know the, the real situation, but it is very clear that uh, going from a subsistence only situation to a surplus production situation was very well possible and uh, yeah, would not have led to very great problems either for the local population uh, as long as they were aware of the limitations on, uh, on labor and surplus takeoff. Uh, well, these were all hypothetical scenarios. Uh, then uh, what Jamie did is also run these in realistic landscapes. Uh, it is, from the point of view of uh, modeling, it is a bit, bit hard, this, because he had to do this in small areas, and this is mainly computational limits issue. Uh, we ran into this uh, at this point, and uh, you have to understand with uh, 1,100 settlements, uh, these models get extremely, extremely complicated, and so if you want to run them in each and every uh, micro region, it takes a lot of time, takes a lot of time to analyze them, and uh, well, there should be a better way for that, but we haven't found it yet. But if you then look uh, at what this means, uh, the two scenarios again, extensification and intensification, and the question whether these uh, are actually uh, making a large demand on land, well, you see uh, the percentage of arable land that is available around the settlements uh, does not run over 50 uh, 50% even if all the households would be very big. Uh, so all the settlements would be very big. There are small, small household settlements and big household settlements. And yeah, so there is quite enough land available in the area. And that was something that had been uh, denied uh, for a long time. There are certain regions where the availability of land is a bit, could be a bit problematic, but not, not in many. However, the other thing is whether uh, they could actually uh, produce a local supply for the actual uh, Roman uh, fortress that was uh, in the area. That turned out to be a lot more difficult. Uh, so in many areas there is no possibility because of the low number of settlements uh, to actually produce enough to provide the fort that is in the actual area. So this means that yeah, a local supply system is not very... Uh, not very probable, and that supply systems would have to be integrated through, uh, throughout the region. Also something that uh, was suggested uh, by archaeologists in the past, and yeah, we think that is quite plausible. So then if there is something like an integrated transport system, uh, yeah, how do we model that? <coughs> Again, uh, we were stepping into an area where there was relatively little work done in computational modeling, and also the research mainly was about uh, imperial scale transport and not about local transport. So that's obviously why we thought that uh, the computer modeling might be, might be helpful here. So we used uh, least cost path analysis and formalized network analysis to reconstruct potential transport, transport routes you've ever seen this kind of uh, work before, you know that it all depends on an estimation of the transport costs. This is the formula that was used for, uh, for trying to figure out how difficult it is to go from one place to the other. Well, depending on uh, what uh, the actual subject is, uh, could be a person or an animal, and uh, what, uh, what is carried, then the main variation is actually in the terrain. So it is more difficult to go from one place to the other, especially in an area like this, where you have peat areas that are almost impossible to go through and sandy areas that are very easy to, uh, to travel. So each and every landscape unit, reconstructed landscape unit, gets this terrain coefficient that will then result in a cost surface and then you can estimate the transport costs going from one location to any other location uh, around, and that looks like this. <coughs> from this, you can then create connections. So in this particular subregion, connections were made between each and every, uh, every settlement. This is not always a realistic uh, assumption, but uh, in order to try out a few things, we, we started with that. From that, uh, you can 
uh, creates a formal network and then you can start playing. So the major uh, thing that is usually done in network analysis to understand if certain places in the network are more important than others is calculating what they call between the centrality. It's a measure of how often you actually need to pass through a place in order to get to another one. Uh, so uh, certain places are hubs. They need to be crossed from very many different directions in order to go from one area to the other. So the big bubbles are the ones that are important. And well, one interesting conclusion here is that it really makes a difference how you travel in the area. If you walk or if you take your ox cart or if you take your mule cart, it makes a difference. Another interesting thing is that uh, because all the settlements are in a very narrow zone over here, most of the transport happens here very neat uh, axis of transportation here. The actual Roman road is running north of that. So it's connecting the fortresses, but it's not connecting the local, uh, the local settlements. Now, this all looks very nice, but there is a big problem with this kind of network analysis. <coughs> because uh, we need to be sure for network analysis that the network is actually a complete network. And given what I just told you about the chronology, this is problematic in many cases. Uh, the results of the network analysis are dependent on the complete network structure, but then we need to be also pretty sure that the network is robust, that it doesn't change a lot even if some of our data is not the most reliable. So that's where Mark did a lot of his work, and I hope I can get this thing running, uh, possibly. <coughs> so. He created models to actually understand uh, how these networks uh, develop if you start from a single site and then try to connect them all uh, to each other. Uh, well, obviously, uh, you can already see this. Uh, there is a point where the thing doesn't change a lot anymore. And it's also in the graph over there. At some point, it's like, okay, well, you can add sites and you can add sites, but it's not going to change the general structure anymore. So that's what was much of his research was about, how to do this how to create these networks and how to make sure that the connections are also made in a way that they still make sense even when certain changes in the, uh, in, uh, in the site database uh, would occur. This led to a complete network reconstruction for the whole area. Uh, not all of it is realistic. I mean, there are some lines that are going straight down there, which we're quite sure that won't have existed because but the network needs to be completed for computational reasons. But you can easily take these out if you think, okay, well, uh, I don't need these. So this is the, yeah, the best possible reconstruction of the local transport network in the area that we can do with our current data set, with our current information on the paleogeography, our current ideas about how people may have traveled in the time. And yes, so the the question is then what kind of uh, results can you get from that? Well, one of the things uh, with the regional market system uh, that I just explained to you is that we, yeah, some sites had been suggested as possible market locations, but it was not very clear why all of these should be market locations. And one of the possible explanations would be that they would be like a hub in the network, that they would be in a geographically uh, advantageous position. Well, we tried to look at it for a few things. Uh, the first of these was the uh, presence of stone-built settlements. Uh, unlike uh, here in France, uh, the large majority of settlements in the area didn't have any stone-built structures uh, during the Roman period, and this is mainly because of the absence of uh, natural stone. Uh, but uh, some uh, settlements clearly uh, developed into stone-built settlements, so they had to import their stuff from a long way uh, away. And you can see uh, that a portion of these actually has a significant high between a centrality. And uh, I should have actually uh, added one little uh, thing here, because the actual number of stone-built settlements is about 5%. 
and you see that the number of stone-built settlements with a high between is centrality. It's not a majority, but it is at least larger than this 5%. It's about 25-35%. So there is a certain category of these stone-built wealthy settlements that are also located in an advantageous position in the network. So that would mean possibly that some of these settlements actually took advantage of their position in the network in order to grow bigger. For other ones, there may have been other explanations for that. And then the other question, whether it was possible to actually directly supply, uh, or if this uh, was a question of first collecting the goods at some other place. Again, we could hypothesize that uh, it would be more advantageous uh, to first collect your goods at a central place before moving it to, uh, to the fortress because it's just easier. And you see here that the actual uh, path length, as is known, so the access, which is a measure of the accessibility of the, uh, of the site. For the Castella, for the fortresses, is actually on the whole larger than for the uh, settlements that were suggested as potential market centers. And especially the ones in dark blue, which were pretty large, uh, they seem to be more strategically located for actually bringing your goods than the actual, uh, actual fortresses. The effect is again not extreme. I mean, uh, they, these are fairly, uh, yeah, fairly small effects, not the kind of sweeping results that you would like to see, but yeah, they give some idea about how this system might have been structured and that in some cases certain places were really better, uh, better located as a potential market center than others. So, lots of work, and uh, we're still writing it up. Um, so, when you look back at this, uh, at a project like this, you think, well, I was so naive, I had thought uh, this would work, and lots of things didn't work. That's the way of science, I think. Uh, one of the things I had completely underestimated that it would be almost impossible to reconstruct the vegetation uh, in the past, so we skipped that very easily, very quickly. Also, the archaeological data analysis, of which I'm still not very happy, uh, but at least I have a better grip of the archaeological data than I had before. It was very complex, and it took a lot more time than I had, uh, than I had assumed. But the paleoeconomic analysis I already indicated a few of the problems, uh, especially uh, the difficulty of getting like production figures for, uh, for example, uh, a herd of sheep. How many sheep are there in a herd? How do they reproduce? Uh, how many animals can you kill without uh, getting into trouble? It was really a very uh, experimental kind of uh, kind of work in in that sense. Um, a bigger problem is that say the macroeconomic patterns are not sufficiently clear in the area. Uh, when I'm talking about uh, things like markets, yeah, these are all suggestions. We don't know very well if this actually was the way it was done. Some places we find evidence for storage facilities, but th that's about it. And yeah, coupled to that, obviously, then uh, it also means that we need to develop uh, better frameworks to understand these cause and effects in such a way that we can also model them. The technical side, um, the actual sensitivity analysis uh, was much more complex than, uh, than I had assumed, and it is uh, because Actually, these things grow exponentially the more parameters you throw into the model, uh, which is logical, but also means that at some point your computer system will just explode and your software will no longer do what you want it to do. I was also a little bit surprised that a uh, software environment like NetLogo, which is supposed to be working with uh, pretty powerful simulations, uh, did not have very good capacities for actually doing the sensitivity analysis within the software. We had to do this outside the software. And uh, yeah, because of this, it was also very difficult to do the scaling up to the region. Eh? Like I showed you the uh, analysis in the micro regions that Jamie did. It sort of works, but it is really not the way I would have liked it to do. And uh, that's um, part of the technical issues. <coughs> On the other hand, I think uh, we came up with a few things that were uh, pretty interesting. Uh, first of all, the landscape reconstruction, apart from the vegetation, worked pretty well. 
we were also very lucky to have lots of uh, data from other researchers that we could use. I think in the end, uh, because of all the work on the archaeological data, we do have a better grip on the settlement pattern and also the transport network reconstruction with all its limitations is, I think, the first one that actually gives us insight in how this might have been organized. Um, where it concerns the paleoeconomic analysis, because uh, we didn't have a lot of things to go on, yeah, Jamie really had to work from the basics. And it also means that we now have a pretty good baseline, I think, for how you actually can model these things. And uh, yeah, some of the things that came out already showed you. Uh, also, things about how people might have managed wood in the area were yeah, completely unexplored. And it turned out that this is actually a very labor-intensive activity that will uh, take a lot of area around the site. So there is a real problem there in understanding uh, how people lived in the past because yeah, where did they get their fuel from, but maybe uh, Simon will know more about that. <laughs> and I think where it concerns the, the technical side, uh, the Roman farming model at the settlement level is uh, yeah, the first of its kind, I think. And uh, I was very happy actually with what came out of the scenarios of surplus production and uh, we also did quite a bit of work on the sensitivity analysis. So, I'm finished. Uh, there's a lot more. There will be published a lot more. Uh, it will be on our website uh, once it is out. And uh, in the meantime, uh, you can send us an email or uh, talk to me. Okay, thank you so much. <coughs>